Hey guys, want to welcome you to um, another edition of Halftime Chat. And um, and today I'm excited to um, welcome Mr. Jeff Sanders from our from the legendary legendary group intro. Um, last week we had Buddy, so it's going to be great to talk to Jeff. Uh, I'm going to bring him on in. Jeff, how are you doing? What's up, my buddy? What's going on? Man? How was everything? <laughs> yeah, I'm, things uh, are good. I'm in my car. I'm sorry for the for the appearance right now. I'm in my car, guys. I was on the road, so I had to pull over. And get on this call what's up man yeah no it's yeah. good it's, 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 it's good to be able to finally uh get you on board um and you know especially your 30 years of intro so um it's yeah it's going to be interesting just to hear your story so we've um yeah so for, for people to to get to know you and your journey um as, as well as um your pl plans for the group as well okay yeah, so we have an international audience, and with all my guests, I always like to find out where you were born and raised, so that we can just get a geographic sense of of your your your, your journey. Well, I'm born and raised in Queens, New York. Um, okay, been there most of my life. Yeah. So this Queens, <laughs> so most of us would think Queens, Nas, um, uh, Mob Deep, <laughs> LL Cool J. Yeah, so in my area where I was born at and raised, um, Elo Kuje lived up the block from me. Fubu lived around the corner. Tribe Called Quest lived about four blocks up. Run DMC lived around f about four blocks um, west. Wow. Uh, who else lived in the neighborhood? Uh, Sherry Hetley from Coming to America lived in the neighborhood. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people, man. Wow. I mean, and then at that time growing up, though, what was, um, I mean, what was like, because, you know, I've heard from people who lived in Harlem and they've spoken about how the life was back in the growing up there. But for you, what was life like growing up as a kid out in Queens? Um, Queens was pretty quiet. Um, as soon as it get dark, you don't see anybody out where I was raised. Uh, I was raised in a church, though. You know, like okay. growing up in my in my youthful times, I if I want to go roller skating, I had to go roller skating with the church. If I want to go to the <laughs> movies, I had to go to movies with the church. You know, it was just my mom is a pastor, um, so she definitely kept us in the church. Um, it was the church is about probably five or seven miles away from the house, and at twelve or even younger than that, if we woke up too late, she would give us that look and say, "You better be there," and you find your way there. So we had to walk like five miles to get to church, or we was gonna get our butt tore up. So that's what life was like at home, and then um, you know. I can add more stuff as the questions come, but go ahead. Yeah, no, but as a kid, what what was it? Were you, um, because we we hear about, uh, you know, for those of us who aren't American, and so the, the, the culture we're hearing is either you're playing sports or you're singing or playing music. What was it for you? Um, So I grew up running track and playing okay. football um, most of my life. Track and field was my love, though, man. I remember joining a track team, um, as a freshman in high school, I was skinny as hell. I was skinny as hell, and um, and then I joined, I joined the summer league when school was out. I came back to school the next following season. Uh, my legs were super swollen. I got big out of nowhere. Like I was like, they was like, yo, how do you get legs like that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> it just happened. So my legs are super muscular, and it just fooled everybody in school. They couldn't believe that I end up with nice muscular legs just over the summer. So, um, yeah, track and field, uh, football was my thing, and, um, yeah. So so when did the um, – I mean, so did you, did you – did you, were you thinking about actually going, you know, university and stuff as an athlete or – Yeah, I was. I was, and then I, I actually attended um, Ross University, which is a veterinarian school in um, St. Kitts and Nevis. So you can look that up. Um, I was there for about six months, and I quit. I couldn't do it. I think I was like maybe one out of eight black people in that school. Um, it was a culture <laughs> shock for me. Like most of the people were from like the, uh, I think most of the white folks were from Europe that went to that school. Um, I had fun, you know, but uh, I missed home really quickly. And um, that's when I ended up diving into the music side. When it comes to music, I first was involved with, um, you know, the hip hop scene big time dancing and hanging out hard with my friends. So, 
Oh, yeah, because I mean, everyone would say that Jeff was known as as the person who with the dance move stuff. So, what was it like for you then? What you, I mean, were you, you know, how? I mean, as I said, we, we know about if we're thinking about hip hop, um, we know about the MCs. But were you part of the dance? Were you doing the dance, or what were you doing? Yeah, we, we was part of a battle dance crew, um, and uh, everybody that you saw in the videos back in the late '80s, early '90s, all of us was friends. We all partied all the time. I remember party. I don't care if it was a snowstorm. We found our way somewhere. <laughs> we walked through the snow. We didn't care. We just needed to get around music. And um, that dancing ended up getting me a gig in Japan uh, with wow. three of my homeboys. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I told my parents I wanted to go to Japan. This guy offered to pay us each 1500 bucks to go there for a week. Um, and my mother was like, absolutely not. No way. My father was like, well, well, well get up now. Let the boys see the world. <laughs> But my mother gave me a hard time. I snuck and got a passport, and uh, I said, Mom, I'm going. So eventually she bit and let me go. And, um, yeah, man, we ended up going to Japan. We got booked, not knowing that we were on a tour because we, you know, we were dancing, and it was a tour with Troop. They had spread my wings at that time. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering, like, who the hell are these guys with the, you know, the haircuts and things like that? But when I saw the perform... <laughs> And they, and they did this move, and they all leaned. I was like, what the hell was that? I was like, oh, no. And then I saw how the crowd reacted. I said, that is what I want to do. And that's what gave me the idea, like, I wanted to be in the show business. Yep, it was that. And, not, you know, don't get me wrong. I grew up around all these rappers. Run DMC used to be parked in front of my crib. I remember driving Pepper from Salt and Pepper home because her car broke down in front of my crib. Because my block was like the known hangout block for all the artists for some strange reason. Wow. And, uh, but yeah, getting, you know, exposed to the music in Japan and seeing Troop perform, Troop is the main reason why I said, when I get back to New York, I'm going to start a group. And this is before I linked up with Kenny and Buddy. I had another group. Okay. That's another, that's another story. Yeah. You, you know, so at the time Troop came out, I was living in Nigeria and we were overwhelmed by just seeing the guys as you know we we, we got introduced to breaking with Togo and Ozen and you know it was you know for us watching that type of dance but seeing a group like Troop we were like wow these guys are dancers who could sing you know we didn't think about there were singers who could dance it just felt like they were dancers first and they then they yeah. sang you were going on tour and you were seeing them how were they on stage and what was it like you know you were going to as a dancer thinking yeah, this is what I'm going to do, but you're seeing them as a crew. It was, you know what? I didn't know they were so down to earth. We became really good friends on the road. Even after coming back to America, we stayed in touch. Me and Rodney was the really closest ones. Um, okay. Steve was cool. Okay. Everybody was cool, man, but Rodney and I clicked, and we used to laugh and bug out. We used to call each other, but honestly, they, I learned some things, too. When they were backstage and I was hanging out in the dressing room with them, they were talking about personal stuff like, yo, man, don't spend that money because I know you when you get home, you're trying to get that apartment. I heard stuff like that. When you get home, I know you're trying to buy that car. So they were really talking about budgeting their money. I was like, shit, they really doing this. Like, <laughs> you know, I thought they were supposed to, you know, spend and, and get the girl, but nah. Troop was definitely focused on their money, and I heard all of those conversations. I'm just quiet, and I'm listening, and I remember hearing all of those things. Yeah. Wow. So you get back, then what happens then with your with career wise? Then what what did you then do? So when I got back, I still continue um, the battle dancing with my friends. We were going to the Apollo. We were killing it at the Apollo, um, doing all the nightclubs. And then I uh, end up meeting a couple of guys, and I say, Hey, listen, I want to start a group. I said, This is where it's going. And I said that um, we need to start a group. So I met this guy named Cornelius. He's from Queens. He's from Left Right, Queens. And that's where Kenny Anderson is from, the basketball player, Kenny Anderson. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you hear the, the raindrops. Oh, it's rain, right? okay. Yeah, I can hear the rain, yeah. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. So I'll, I'll talk loud. So Kenny Anderson was from Left Rag. That's where Cornelius is from. Cornelius introduced me to this guy named Al, who lived in Brooklyn. Al was the guy that wore his collar up all the time. He thought he was like the flyest dude ever. You couldn't tell him nothing. He had this real raspy voice, but it was soft. It wasn't strong. And all the rehearsals had to be at our house. So here I am, coming from Queens. And back in those days, the trains weren't as fast as they are today. So it took me a while to get to Brooklyn to go to our house. We get to our house. He's taking his time coming downstairs. We're sitting in the living room. I was like, in my head, I'm like, this guy. 
So I went to the rehearsals like two or three more times, and I was always late. I said, I can't do this no more. I'm done. And that's when I uh, left the group. Wow. Yep. But, but were you supposed to be singing, or was it still dancing? No, this is all a singing group that we formed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. But then where, were you, where, where did you learn to sing, though? Where, where? Church. Church, oh, you know. Okay. I come from a Pentecostal church, so it's all hickering, and hollering, and singing. Every, if you listen to most Pentecostal churches, more uh, Kojic churches, um, it's, it's all musically uh, driven. You know, it's yeah. all about most of the most of the singers that you hear today that are R and B. Yeah, they're they're gospel background first. Most of them. yeah, but I mean, for those of us who who know, okay, but then were you singing? Would you would you sing in lead as well, or was it just mainly choir? Or were, or you? Yeah, you know what? It's my first lead song, and I remember leading it with the choir, and my mother still has that tape. <laughs> I gotta let buddy hear it. I swear, to my mother found the tape recently. It was a song called "Do You Love Everybody." And then the crowd, I mean, um, the choir responds, yes, Lord. And if you, if you, uh, what is it? If you have the love of Jesus in your heart, yes. And that was a song. And I was probably nine when I led that song. My cousin was the choir director. She was amazing. And uh, she taught me that song. And I remember the church, we had visitors at the church that night. That night. Because, you know, you go to church Sunday, <laughs> then you come back Sunday night. So that night, it was a visiting church. And it was crowded, and I was nervous as what. But, um, yeah, Do You Love Everybody? Yes, Lord. Yep, that was my first song I ever sung with the choir. Um, I actually was a drummer uh, with the choir for a little bit. Okay. Yep. And then she bought me from the drums. I want you to sing the song. So that's when uh, it really started, yeah. So, the, and, and, I, and, I, and I only say this is just really just think that when you when you are looking to start a group, how many of you guys could are proper singers as opposed to, okay, we just find out, you know, because actually for us as fans, we notice a lot of 90s groups had the main singer and everyone else sang kind of background. So it was interesting to see that actually you actually could sing, sing on your own, um, even though the label might have just said, yeah, let's just put the one out there. But um, when you were looking to form a group in those early days, were you looking to say, okay, yeah, we all take our part and we all sing? Did you have any groups that you looked at and thought you, we could be like them? Oh, wow. I mean, groups prior to us, I'm not, even, I'm not going to even go way back, but that was close uh, to our times. You know, I looked at Men Condition. Um, I mean, I even looked at, I, I was focused on a lot of gospel at the time. Um, Fred Hammond and Commission was definitely a, a driven force um, in intro. Um, but, um, you know, and I, I can be honest, and I'm going to be blatantly honest, all three of us had our own thing going, um, but when we got to the point where, and I don't want to fast forward, so, but I can tell you now, I knew my place. Let's put it that way. I knew my place. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get that. Okay. But, so when you quit the group because of how the uh, the guy was doing, what, what do you think would happen next? Uh, I said I'm going to find somebody else. So I had a friend named Peekaboo who was a choreographer for like Salt and Pepper, um, Kwame, Kid and Play. Um, we all used to hang out. In the in night scene, in the clubs and everything. Peekaboo um, knew that I was trying to form another group. And he said, yo, I know this dude that lives in North Carolina. And um, my grandmother lives down there, and his name is Buddy. When I go down there again, I'm going to tell him about you. So he told Buddy about me. And then when Buddy came to New York to see his mom, uh, Peekaboo brought Buddy over to my home. And we met each other. I could tell you now, did you ever see the Temptations movie? Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Okay. So you remember the scene where Otis and what's his name, Bubba? No, the one with the deep voice. Uh, 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 yeah, I know. Yeah, Williams. Yeah, but yeah, I can't remember his name. Yeah. Yeah, Otis yeah. showed up at his house, and Otis and he said, "I heard you want to join." Otis said, "I heard you want to join my group." He said, "I heard you want to join my group." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was the, with me and Buddy. It was the same thing. So in my head, I'm thinking he want to join the group I'm putting together. <laughs> Buddy is like, and they say, "I want." You know, it was the same thing. But you know what? By the grace of God, everything was formulating. We didn't even know it. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't see it coming, but we felt something. Like when I met him, it was like a perfect fit. And but when I looked at him, I was like, "But I know you from somewhere." And he said, "Yeah, you do look familiar. We probably freaking grew up riding bikes, like he said, 
when we was younger because he's from Queens. I mean, he's from Brooklyn, but he also had a lot of family in Queens. So uh, we could have crossed paths way before we met each other in our adult lives. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yep. So you met Buddy first. I did. I met Buddy first. Um, we started kicking it, you know, hanging out. Um, he said, yo, bro, I know this guy, man. Uh, it's going to be hard, but I might be able to find him. He was in the Army with me. He said, Jeff, when I tell you he's that dope, I said, yo, you need to find him. <laughs> um, at that time, Buddy was still active in the military, so Buddy was coming back and forth. When I mean this boy, he did not care. He was coming. <laughs> But he was like, yo, I know I'm in the military, but I'm breaking these rules to get here. He, <laughs> so, he felt something, too, because most guys, they were like, eh, but this dude was resilient. He was a relentless. Like, he was not trying to, you know, stop the motion. So two weeks went by, and he, he called me on the phone. Yo, Jeff, I found him. I was like, who? He said, the guy was telling me about Kenny. I said, okay, that's dope. He put Kenny on the phone, bro. Kenny was country. I don't know what. Hey, what's going on, man? <laughs> I said, what's up, bro? He said, y'all heard so much about you. Um, buddy, speak highly of you. He said, you were like the man down there. He said, Kenny was so modest. Ah, you know, I did a little something here and there. <laughs> when he said a little something here and there, just before he sung, I said, okay, he did a little something here and there. And then we was talking about music, and he said, yo, y'all listen to Commission? I said, hell yeah, I listen to Commission. Buddy said, yeah, man, we listen to Commission. And then um, he mentioned a song, um, what was one of the commission songs that we actually knew? We, anyway, Kenny starts singing it, but we all sung it, and we all like jumped in harmony-wise. It was like the most amazing sound over the phone. I said, bro, you need to get here. And Kenny was like, yo, 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 uh, Kenny, yo, man, you need to come to New York, bro. Kenny was like, I ain't never been here before. I said, yo, I don't, I said, yo we'll take care of you, bro. Just come. So Buddy got him a bus ticket, I believe. And um, he came to New York, but he picked him up and brought him to Queens, and he ended up staying at my parents' house. And I was still living with my parents at the time. Okay. And uh, it was a perfect thing because now we had all the space to rehearse. Um, we had food and shelter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we had us, you know. So we rehearsed every day till we were starving and hungry. And But we were rehearsing to original stuff. It wasn't like other people's stuff. It was stuff that Kenny was coming up with, and he was structuring the harmonies. Yo, Jeff, I want you to sing this part. Kenny, I mean, Buddy, sing this part. And it was, like, the most amazing thing to actually talk about because people were – we rehearsed in my parents' backyard, but everybody was coming to the back to listen, like people that lived in the neighborhood that normally did not come in my yard. They, were, they heard us, and they were coming back. there, just standing there looking at us, and we didn't know what was going to happen. We just, it's something that we found that was amazing and we love doing it. Our goal, of course, was hopefully to get a record deal, but we were so far, far away from that. You know, we were still in the backyard, you know, rehearsing for God knows what. And, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the question I have, because you know, we hear Queens and we think about the, um, the, the, the foundation of hip hop uh, with all of those acts. R&B itself wasn't. Um, I mean, apart from, say, Guy Group and, and then Uptown, what was it that you, did you guys see groups that are out and think, yeah, we could be like them? And Jodeci come out at Guy, with Guy still popping it? Absolutely. So, absolutely. Jodeci came out before us. Um, and I think Jodeci came out in 1991. And that's yeah, when we actually, true. we formed a group in 1991. As well, okay. let's, let's go back. So, Kenny and Buddy um, were the group first. Um, because when in the army they end up having an independent record deal and they put out some music overseas. It was like uh, it was house music with um, a twist of R and B. It was different, and um, and then Kenny moved you know out of the army and and that was that. And then when we came back together, that's when I learned the stuff they'd done together. So the group they used intro that name during that independent time, and it's so we have a funny story about that too. How they got out of that contract. You're gonna love this one. <laughs> Whenever you're ready for that, I will get back to that. But um, as far as um, Guy, Guy was like the ultimate group to look at being from New York. They were the ultimate group to look at. And then Jodeci came with a whole new twist. We didn't want to be like Jodeci or we didn't want to be like Guy, but we were so influenced by the, the ideas. But Guy was like the staple in New York at the time. Definitely. 
So for hip hop fans, was Guy the the sort of bridge so you could enjoy R and B if you were still hip hop? Was that the case? Or? Nope, it wasn't oh. even that because you gotta remember they did they did um New Jack Swing. We took actual popular hip hop records and took the instrumentals and had the uh, producers lay keys, strings, bass lines around it and made it. And that idea really comes from what they call blend. So DJs like um, uh, DJ Clue um, and a few other DJs, they used to take an old 1970s classic hit with a hip-hop beat and blend it. Like, something in the way you make me feel. They used that with um, a hip-hop beat, and they blend it together. And that's where the idea of singing on top of hip-hop and R&B really came from. Mm -hmm. Although we didn't pinpoint that. But honestly... The DJs in Queens was doing that first. They were known for blending. So, but, um, yeah. So you said, well, when Guy came out, it, it just, it, did that just shake the, I mean, like how R&B can be cool for young kids? Oh, absolutely, man. If you look at Guy, we're like the little brothers of Guy. If it was three of them, it was three of us. You know, we have, we have freaky songs. They have freaky songs. <laughs> we, we had some, we had some classics. They had classics, but, you can't take away from Guy. Guy was like, and if you want to add hip hop to it, even though it was New Jack Swing, it was still hip hop. Mm. Only reason why it's called New Jack Swing because Teddy penned that. But at the end of the day, it was still hip hop, and Guy was definitely the foundation for sure. Wow. And so, you know, so when 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 you you're hearing Kenny sing and you and you're in the backyard, do you see a record deal? I mean, but you're talking about. Salt and Pepper, you're talking about you know, Randy MC Bean and your neighbor, they've all got record deals. I would have thought you would have known, okay, I know who to who, who to reach out to. We, uh, how can I say this? So being <laughs> that, um, I remember we went to, the guy that got us to go to Japan, we went to his apartment. He was an old school connect, um, but if you think about it, he didn't really do nothing for us, but from there we end up going to this known open mic spot where people started hearing us, and then um, what happened? Oh, we just went to a club, and we met Heavy D, and it went from there. But um, we didn't have any, like, real connects, honestly. You know, I was a, a socialite, you know, that connected us to Heavy at that night. We met Heavy. So if you want to go that route, being that, we'd be able, being that we were able to get into the clubs free, um, Heavy D was in VIP, and at that time, VIP was a real VIP. It was separate from the regular club. It was like <laughs> upstairs in another room. They got the red ropes, two security guards at the door, but I knew them. I said, buddy, Kenny, y'all want to go upstairs? They was like, yeah. We went upstairs, and there was just two people up there, Andre Harrell and Heavy D. And you knew who and Andre was? Did. Oh, yeah. We knew who he was, definitely. I knew him from, you know, from the scene. But um, Buddy said, oh, shoot, they'll go Heavy D. And we all walked over there, and Buddy said, yo, we want to sing for you. And Head was like, sing for me? Yeah. And then I said, in the bathroom, let's go in the bathroom. He was like, uh-uh, sing for me right now. <laughs> and then the speaker loud from the club. I like, how are you going to sing? And then we sung Peaceful Journey from uh, uh, Joe to C and Father MC. You're on my mind. You know, that, was from that. Heavy D, that was from Heavy D on the Peaceful Journey album. Yes. Well, no, no, no. Did we sing that? No, we didn't sing that one. Oh, my bad. Are we you... sung the Father MC joint in Jodeci. Oh, um... Oh, my bad. I got oh, the song wrong. Um... We, but we used, to, we used to practice with that, too, though. Okay. But, um... Treat him. Yeah, it, it was a Father... Him? No, it was a Father MC record with Jodeci singing in the background. Yeah, treat them like they want to be treated? Uh-uh. It was another one. Um... It was uh... another one. Buddy, okay. I know you're watching... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sure somebody will say somebody will say. Yeah, okay, so it'll come to me, but yeah, that's that was the song we sung, and then Head was like, uh, "All right, cool, cool, no expression, cool, cool. Let me get your number. Cool, we gave him our number, and Buddy, when we walked away from him, Buddy looked back and said, "Man, he ain't calling us." I said, "Why not?" He said, "Man, he pulled our number and put it in his pocket." I was like, "Damn," and I Head was like, "He definitely ain't calling us. He just pulled our number up and put it in his pocket." We went on with our day, and uh, that Everything's night... Everything's going to be all right. Joe. Everything's nope. going to be no. all right. No, 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 
no, that wasn't it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got people. Um, to, okay, but anyway, go ahead. So you, 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 you after you left the, <laughs> after you left the club, ironically, Casey and JoJo we was playing an old demo of ours in a car, um, and Casey and JoJo heard the demo from a producer named Janar Parker at when they recorded something at Janelle Parker's house, they heard that demo. So when Casey and Jojo walked to the car, Jojo came out to the car and he knew the song and he was singing mm-hmm. the hook. He said, yo, that's y'all. That's y'all. Yeah. I heard this before. And Jojo knew the song. I'm looking like, Oh shit. That's Jodeci. They know I shit. <laughs> and then we ran it. We ran it to them again at a, 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 a roller skating rink in New Jersey. It was Devante, Jojo and KC. And that's how we met Devante. And Devontae was originally supposed to sign us first. He took our numbers down. He said, I want to work with you guys. We ended up going to his house in Jersey with Jodeci all lived together. And um, we sat around a piano. And Devontae, Devontae created a song called um, I Don't Want to Fall in Love with a Stranger. Uh-huh. And he said, Jeff, this is your part. Buddy, this is your part. Kenny, this is your part. And um, we sung the song. It was it was a really pretty song, but they end up going on tour, and uh, they took too long, man. And then we end up getting a phone call. Get from who? Heavy. heavy D. He called my mom. Cause we was, we end up going back to North Carolina with Buddy because Buddy had to go back to the military, and we okay. said, man, we coming down there. We didn't want Buddy to get in trouble, so we said, you know what, Kenny, we need to go down. We jumped in Buddy's white Jetta with him, and we rode down to North Carolina. And we started rehearsing. As Buddy came back from work, we rehearsed every day again. And I said, let me call home. Not calling home to see if Heavy D called. I said, um, oh, Buddy said it was Peaceful Journey. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Buddy said it was Peaceful Journey. So anyway, <laughs> um, so we got back. And I said, let me call home. Oh, but, yeah, Buddy said it's Peaceful Journey. I'm sorry. He's texting Okay, me. Peaceful so Journey. I was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we sung that to Heavy. And that's I think that's what's still the deal right there. Yeah. So yeah, okay. um, I called home in New York. You know, I'm ten miles. I'm ten hours away from New York City in North Carolina. I called home, check on my family. My mother. I said, did anybody call for me? She said, Yeah, some man ain't hefty. Something hefty. <laughs> I said, I said, Do you mean Heavy D? She said, That's his name. That's his. <laughs> I was like, for real? She said, yeah. She said, uh, give him a call. She gave me the number. It was a 914 area code. I was like, what the hell is this? In New York, it was only, in New York City, it was only New York, it was uh, 212 and 718 at the time. Queens, Brooklyn, and Bronx had 718. Manhattan was the only one that had the 212 area code at that time. Uh, so we called, and we were all like, eager to hear what he said. He said, this is, this is how, yo, where y'all at? We was like, we're in North Carolina. He said, can y'all get up here? We was like, hell yeah. But he did not care again. <laughs> but he said, well, yeah, I'm going. We jumped in Buddy Jetta. I don't know. I think it was the next day. Yeah, the next day. We jumped in Buddy's Jetta and we drove to New York. He said, I want you to meet with my boy Heavy. I mean, um, Eddie F. He got his own thing going on. We was like, oh, shoot. DJ Eddie F too? So we drove to New York. <laughs> And we end up getting to the address that uh, ADF gave us, uh, DJ ADF's uh, office. When we get there, man, Eddie was moving and all of his new stuff into his new office. We became the moving people. <laughs> Not even getting the chance to sing for him yet. He said, oh, yo, yo, I, I, I need you to help me grab stuff. So we started loading up his office with desks and chairs and, and paperwork and everything. And I don't know if you ever watched The Odd Couple. You know Tony Randall? Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Tony Randall from the Odd Couple, he was the the real super nerdy one in the in the, in the, um in the TV show. He was on the same floor as Heavy. I mean, um, Eddie F. I was like, I was holding the furniture. I was like, oh shoot, Tony Randall. He said, like, yes, yes. He said, like, but guys, can y'all keep it down some? We were loud. <laughs> so we ended up getting we ended up getting the furniture in the office, and. uh this is like 11 o'clock at night. We finished. Because we arrived at his office around probably close to 9 p.m. Um, and uh, we, I'm surprised Buddy didn't get told. Because I believe we parked in the area where we weren't supposed to park. <laughs> so I'm surprised he didn't get told or get ticketed. 
And if you get ticketed, I don't know. I, I owe you. I, I suppose I'll pay that, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so he sat down. He literally sat down in the chair while we're still standing up. He said, Whew. okay, let me hear y'all. <laughs> I'm like, we're, we just we should be sitting down too. But we stood up and we end up singing original stuff that Kenny wrote. Wow. While we're singing, he's just dialing the phone. Yeah, uh, I'm calling you back. We still singing? He must have called probably 10 people that day, that night. And uh, he was smiling. He said, Yo, I like y'all, man. Y'all dope. He said, Where y'all living at? Where y'all staying at? I said, Well, I live in Queens, but I live in Brooklyn, but buddy's still working in North Carolina. He's, and I said, But we don't worry about that. We'll work it out. <laughs> I said, Kenny's in Queens with me. He said, Yo, bet, bet. From there, everything just flew. Everything started coming together. We never left Eddie since. And, um, I mean, at that time. So, you know, it was by the grace of God. We didn't see everything forming, but I'm telling you now, looking back, now you can see the pieces coming together. Wow. Now you can see everything forming. Like, you've seen the pavements coming together on the road. Like, this is actually how it went. But we didn't see it. I mean, the amazing thing is that, you know, and, and I always wonder, because Heavy... Um, Probably he was still focused on the music side, um, but he t did he ever say why he got, gave you to Eddie instead of trying to do it himself or not taking well, charge? Time? Well, Eddie F just got his situation, and he knew that mm -hmm. Eddie F needed artists. Heavy, so let's say this: Heavy wasn't selfish because he easily, he easily could have, um, he easily could have said, "This is mine," but he yeah. gave it to his boy because he knew his boy needed to fill up the roster. So that was an unselfish move. Although Heavy could have easily kept us for himself. I mean, that's and that's important people to hear because you know when you when you because most people were hearing, okay, I'm going to sign you guys to my production stuff, but Eddie, you released them, so I'm getting a piece of everything, you know. But he's just like, yeah, go over here. So that's 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 an awesome thing. So did you guys then? How did you guys then ask the side as a, as as the three of you how? how you know who's going to be singing who's going to be writing who's going to be producing i mean whose role was where like i said when we heard kenny we knew he was a driven force to be reckoned with like it was a different sound the way we saw him write music although we all knew how to write we all knew how to sing we just knew that he was the nucleus we knew that this is it with kenny he could drive this i mean with all three of us it probably wouldn't have worked with just one person but with all three of us, we knew it was it, but Kenny was the frosting on the cake. The first thing you bite into, a, you know, you're going to hit that frosting, and you knew that. When you hear intro, you knew, or when you hear Kenny, you just knew it was him. So it was it was a perfect fit. We knew not to ruffle those feathers. So I, I so here, I've always, um, I always have, so um, I understand, you know, Kenny is very similar to Aaron and Casey, um, or you bring in Coco from SWV, you know, those kind of powerhouse vocals that, you know, that you just can't undeniably power, powerhouses. But I always got concerned about just, um, the group being wholly dependent on, on the one person. At the time, did you guys think about, well, if Kenny's singing lead in all the main songs, would, 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 would it take away our shine? Did you ever, was it in those early days? Well, well, on the first album, we didn't think that way. It was plans for us to all do um, individual songs on the second album. But again, Kenny's father passed away. His mindset was in a different world. And me and Buddy said, we're going to fall back and let him, let him bleed out what he got coming out of him. And, you know, that album was really dedicated to um, his father. Yeah. Okay. So, but then when, when you when you guys started, then when you when when you, when you, okay, you got your deal with, with with Eddie and the Untouchables, when it comes to coming up creating the music, what was it like then? How did the three of you um, work together on on producing the intro album, on creating the intro album? Uh, Eddie F did the first single, uh, Love Thing. We we recorded that whole song in two hours. He actually put white labels out and handed it to all the DJs. Wow. And we just we we blew up overnight. You know, it was, it was on the radio every day uh, from that from that white label single. Uh, it wasn't even a record deal yet, to be honest. Wow. Nope. Nope. And that takes us to where we're at today. 30 years yeah. in the game. 
Yeah, I mean, so so when when he he when he was when he put it out, so did did, did you guys were you guys like Tupac just constantly making music, um, or because you know when because yeah, I know yeah. that you guys had stuff that went on to Mary's stuff and you had you know so you know when in between when you're making the album are you just making and recording so many songs or what was every day we was in the studio every day catch this Eddie's studio was in his house it was called the mini mansion um that house had the most amazing studio and we lived there all we had to do was come downstairs all we had to do was come downstairs and we worked so yeah we, we recorded a ton of songs a ton of songs yeah so uh, when it comes to the um, the other parts of it, so you're recording the songs, and you said Kenny could write really fast. Did what about yourself? I mean, did what was your main role? Uh, well, no, no. So we at that time we focused on letting Kenny be the driven uh, force with the writing, because at the end of the day, the record company when they see something that's golden more than shining, uh, they would say, you know what? Although I know you guys can do what you do, we want Kenny to do this. We want Kenny to do that. But they didn't discount us. But at the end, and we also had a timeline too. We needed to get the albums done at a certain amount of time. We needed to get the songs recorded. Studio time was very specific back then. So, you know, me sitting around for two hours writing a song or changing the hook and this and that, when Kenny could come and knock out a song in 30 minutes, it was more beneficial wow. to use what he had. You know, even um, Ecstasy of Love. I wrote that on a freaking toilet, bro. On the first album. <laughs> I was on the toilet and I heard the melody and I, I, I wrote it and I went to um, Jannar Parker's house and I laid down a hook and then I called Kenny and Buddy. I said, yo, check this out. He said, yo, that's dope. And that was that. So, Wow. D D Kenny, and Buddy, Kenny and Buddy, you know, that was their, come inside was their record. Yeah. yeah how, how is that like then when you guys are as a group when it comes to the songs and, you, you know, we heard about Lennon and McCarthy, um, you know, and they're doing the main main songs, and George Harrison and, and Ringo don't uh, weren't doing it, contributing as much. But within the group, I mean, if Kenny can just knock it out, and Buddy can, it's good at you know writing and producing. Do you then think, okay, we, we need to all do it together, or no, I'm going to do mine separately and we bring it in? I mean, uh, the dynamics. How was that like? No, no, it wasn't like that. We didn't have that. I know you've seen the movie. Um, Rhapsody with Queen, we didn't have that kind of beef. Um, okay. We knew what it was. We knew what it was. And at the end of the day, it was a unit um, that was still have to move forward, um, regardless how who shined that will or who washed that car or whatever. We knew that at the end of the day, when the product is done, we all are equal when we're going out there. It's not about me fighting over money, not about me fighting over publishing. It was about the right people doing the right thing. And Kenny had the right formula. So I, I was never jealous, never arguing about anything when it comes to that. When it comes to money, no. But so, but you know, but that's very unique and rare uh, because, uh, and I don't know if it's because it's the first album and everyone's just excited to be in it. But as I said, it's really good to have that 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 type of approach because that tends to divide groups later down the line. It's like, oh, he took you know he made more money writing and he he got more of the shine and stuff. The, and that seems to be dividing some of our, our, our groups right now. But for yourself, mm -hmm. for you, what was your vision when you saw how everything was, you know, here's Eddie F from Heaven and the Boys, you know, yeah. you brought his untouchable producers to come in and put music to these amazing songs. What did you, Where did you think you guys were going to be? It was all about having a great body of work, you know, regardless how, we get, how, how it got done. Um, yeah, in our heads, we wanted to do more. But we saw what the record company was leaning towards. We saw what the producers was leaning towards. And and, and you look at the history of in the music business and groups, it's always one person that's going to get more shy than everybody else. Every group has that. Because one person to them, that's the star in their head, mm. quote, unquote. That's, that, that's our moneymaker right there. We didn't care. Wow. Like, at the end of the day, that's, not, that's still our brother. We're all going to eat. So. <laughs> okay. So then what was your role in the group then? Um, because, you know, when you talk to different members of, the, of different groups, they all had, okay, I was the I was the one who did the stage production or I was the one who, you know, made sure yeah, we managed so, business. What, what was yours, Jeff? There was three components in intro. You had the writer, 
you had one that was more gifted with production, and you had one that had vision for what the group would look like or how it would move on stage. Kenny was the writer, but he always, always um, produced before we even got to do it with um, Eddie F and M. All right, so. Kitty Buddy was the, if you look at production, Buddy was the producer of the group, and I was the choreographer. And I also I brought in other choreographers. Those are my friends that I grew up with in, in the dancing game. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's how it was. Same mm-hmm. thing with, uh, same thing with, uh, what's that group jo- uh, Jody Watley was in? Uh, Shalomar. Shalomar. Shalomar had the same components. You had, you had the writer. Well, not a producer, but you know, but they had their um, their dancer, their choreographer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So it was pretty much that. Listen, man, we didn't make a big deal of it. Um, at the end of the day, show money split equally. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, that's not that's not separated. Um, those that get money from production or production um, or writing, they're supposed to get that money. Mm-hmm. He did the work; you get the money. Why would you get mad at that? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, as I said, what you're saying, you're saying it how most how it's supposed to be, but it, it's definitely not how majority of people are. So it's really refreshing to get a very different um, take or take on things. How yeah. was success for you when it when you know come inside is uh, the uh, love things blowing uh, up and then and what was success like for you? I'm gonna tell you right now. When love thing first came out, I was so. Cause I told my family I'm working on music. They was like, yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> when Love Thing first came on the radio, I'm sitting in my parents' living room. I say, that's us. They was like, okay, yeah, whatever. I said, okay. I left it just like that. Next thing you know, we're doing a video two weeks later in Manhattan. My mother said, where you at? I said, we shooting a video. They was like, stop playing. I said, we shooting a video. I said, matter of fact, here's the address. My mother and my sister and a couple more people came down. It was a cold, frigid night. And they saw the lights. They saw the trailers. They was like, <laughs> I said, this is us. I, I, didn't, I didn't brag to my family at all. I said it one time. That's us. They said, okay. I said, okay. <laughs> Video shoot. I said, now y'all believe us? They was like, oh, shoot. Yep. <laughs> Come Inside came out. Come Inside came out. It was a very hard song to perform. You know, my mom being from the church. But <laughs> yeah. Then, a deacon, you know, his mom wasn't having it. His mom was real strict. And us to sing that on stage, bro, we looked at each other like, yo, you know we're going to get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we performed it in New York at the Apollo. It was Intro Silk. I can't remember who else was on that show with us. Could have been SWV. I don't remember. But, man, the whole place, it was like an earthquake when Come Inside came on. I said, we're about to get it. You know we're going to get it, right? So, um yeah, when our family heard it and knew what it meant. <laughs> I think it's was, SWV that, that introduced you guys. Yeah, you should have saw their face. Wow. And they, they were not happy. They weren't happy at all. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I tell them now, I say, listen, come inside means to come, in, come into my room. <laughs> it, come, it, means to come into the, it means to come into the church. Come inside. I've been making up all types of stuff. <laughs> but you, did you tell them what, you, what, you, what was happening on the on the album on the on the in the, on the actual album to this, version? To this day, I never told my mom. And you know that was real, right? Well, that's that was that's, real. That's, you that was real. And uh, I never told them in detail what happened. I said, "Oh, we just acting." But no, it was, it was a snowstorm that night maybe like four in the morning, three, four in the morning. And me and the young lady first started acting it out and it didn't sound right at all. I told the producer and engineer, listen, I'm going to close the blinds and because the big 360 um, booth, a big one. I said, I'm going to close the blinds and we're going to do what we do. They say, huh? Said, Just follow my lead. And it was real. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> the, um... <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, and we we are talking about thirty years when that album came out. So we're talking about twenty uh, uh, twenty ninety uh, no, ninety three. Um, when you, wh- what's it like from going from you know you're you're singing in your your mom's backyard to now you you're on you're on the Apollo you're on, you're on BET you 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 know you you you're on Soul Train and all that stuff. Um, What's that like to you? I mean, can you still go back home? Or did the, the whole neighborhood assume now you're millionaires? <laughs> so New York City, 
don't care who you are. New York City don't care how, fam- how famous you are. You're looked at as a normal person in New York City. I've seen Adam Sandler walk in the streets of New York. I've seen so many famous people that, like, woo. Everybody, like, New York, don't, they don't bite up to that. When you go to other places, it's a different story. It's like we've been chased through the malls. It's a different story. But in New York, it was never, ah, ah. Nah, not New York. New York is like, yo, I love your music. Just, just real calm. I love it, man. Oh, okay. Okay. That's it. Yeah, that's how New York, yeah. So you did have families assuming that okay, that's it, you're going to be moving to you know Manhattan. To- I have families, I have families that was expecting a check from me. <laughs> everybody was expecting money from me. So family, are you watching? I I saw it coming, but everybody was expecting money. <laughs> I just I never saw before I was coming to our family reunions, coming to my family's house. It was like it was definitely a wake up call. You couldn't, you can't take care of everybody. You mm-hmm. can't take, you know. Anything I've done, I've done it for my media family, my parents, my, my sisters, and my brothers, but you can't take care of everybody, unfortunately. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's something that Hammer had to learn, learn from, that you can't, you know, it, um, because there's, there's always going to be somebody that wants to eat. Even Jay-Z, as bit rich as he is, he's saying the same thing. Um, yeah. As, as big as Jay-Z is. So, as, as I said, but how do you manage that, though? Where they're not attacking you and they're not assuming, and they're, oh, I'm not you know pressuring what? your parents. You, you have to stay. You have to stay humble with your family. You know, it starts with the family first. No way in the world should you start getting big headed around your own family. That's the mm-hmm. worst thing ever. That's your blood. That's your lifeline. Nothing's gonna last forever. God forbid it's all over, and you need to lean on family. They're gonna remember how you treated them. So I was raised to treat people the way I want to be treated. So if I had money in my pocket and they asked for it, I gave it. I gave it. Now, wasn't I giving, I wasn't giving out two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, but I was giving out hundreds. Uh, no, okay. you know, here, turn on your lights, you know, pay the car note. Oh, you blew your engine in your car? Here's $4,000. Fix that. You know, I was doing things like that, definitely. The, the, you know, a, a big part of the 90s um, it was the everyone getting – not having the right kind of business deals and, and, and not reading the contracts, not getting the right lawyers and stuff. What was it like for you guys? Because as I said, most, you know, very few people have had good experiences, but what was it like for you guys? Everything that we've gotten and gained from the music industry, we appreciate, regardless how bumpy some of the roles may have been. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you going back, we were signed to Eddie F's production company called The Untouchables. Yeah. And with the Untouchables, they end up getting us a record deal with Atlantic Records. So Atlantic Records were responsible for paying Untouchables. Untouchables were responsible for paying us. The money we received from Untouchables, it kept us, you know, it kept the roof over our heads. It kept clothes on our backs. It kept our stomachs full. So for us to say, we didn't just get that. You know, listen, we got to stop crying for something that's not, you know, it, how do I say this? We were very grateful how things worked out, regardless how other people say we should have gotten this or should have gotten that. Mm. I'm not arguing about that. I'm still here. I'm still grateful. I'm making money. I'm making more money than the average person right right now. Mm. So all things are they all connected. They all connected. It formed us to who we are today. Yeah. And if it wasn't for ADF, yeah. if it wasn't for ADF and Heavy D, who knows where we would have been today? Regardless mm-hmm. of how much money people say we should have gotten, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm happy. Yeah. Buddy's yeah. happy. Our friends and family are happy. And that's it. Yeah. So when it comes to the success of the first album, then you're going to do um, New Birth. Um, and then, you know, we had... New um, Life? Sorry. New sorry, Life. Birth. Yes. <laughs> New Life, um, and I was just listening to it the other day, and I did tell um, I t- told Body that my favorite song was. Um, oh goodness, I've just lost it right now, but I'll 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 um, I'll, I'll, I'll get it out now. Okay. But when you know when Kenny was dealing with his you know the loss of his dad, but unbeknownst to you and the rest of us, that actually he was actually dealing with something personal that eventually took his life. When did you, as as a member, you know, you guys have, you know, 
success and you know work together. When did you realize that he was actually that you were losing him when he was putting all the stuff in in the music? Um, Kenny told us. That oh, he, he did. Ill. He told us that he was ill. Yeah, I really don't like to go too deep, but I can tell you that he he told us that he was sick, and we made it our business to make sure he got to the doctor. Um, one thing I do regret is not visit him as much. Honestly, I visited Kenny twice. I went with my mother once, and I went by myself. Uh, and I probably needed therapy, to be honest. I never experienced someone that sick. And I was, I was like, going out a lot by myself, just thinking about not just the group, about him and, and just not understanding the whole process. I wasn't even educated enough on the sickness, and um, I just didn't want to be bothered with anybody. I didn't trust people that um, would try to do events or things in his name because at the end of the day, I felt that it was using his name to make money off of it or whatever. I just didn't trust nobody at that point, man, and I was just always to myself. It was a very um, hurtful moment, and, you know, it made you think of from the time he came to New York, all the laughters we had, he was a funny, funny guy. Um, you know, being around the family, being on the road, um, just all the things we've done. It's a, it's a freaking movie to see him pass and go on. So I thank God that we had the moment we had with Kenny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, I, and I think a lot of us... Um you know, intros would be listed as one of our favorite groups, but because you just had just the two albums and we didn't get to see more of his, of Kenny singing, it then sometimes when you're looking at the group lead singers, you're thinking about, okay, Aaron and and maybe, um, you know, um, KC, and, and you think about that, and, and Kenny doesn't get mentioned as much, but because, as I said, his his, his life was, 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 was caught short and stuff, for yourself, and you know, I'm a therapist, and I, and I and I'm part of a big part of why I do a lot of this stuff is to really try and get to normalize, um, is to really talk about successes and the falls and and the rises, but also with it for for us within our community, we, we tend to just say, well, let's, let's go pray about it, instead of realizing actually, you know, it's normal to get to talk about pain and 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 stuff. Was there any moment that you thought, oh, that's it, no lead singer? Then what's up you with mean, the rest of it? You mean, you mean as, are you saying after, after he passed? Yeah, as you know, this is your the lead single of the group. And so oh, yeah, just... oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was definitely a wake-up call. Like, we both took a break and, like, what just happened? Did this shit just really happen? Yeah, so, you know, just like TLC felt the same way, um, just like um, High Five felt the same way, even uh, H-Town felt the same way. You know, mm. we all took a moment and we, we fell back and had to recollect ourselves, like, how do we move forward without our brother? And for me and Buddy, I think it took us six, seven years. Six years. Wow. Yeah, to move forward, like, really. It was a lot to uh, to deal with, you know, mentally, uh, just all the memories. It's just, yeah. And, and Buddy probably hurt, felt it even more because he knew Kenny longer than me. Mm -hmm. It was in the military together. So yeah. Now, what does Atlantic do? Does Atlantic say, "Oh, no lead singer, get a new person," or, you, or we're going to drop you? What? What? How does the label handle that? No. So uh, before Kenny died, we had left Atlantic Records. Uh, oh. Yeah. So we were actually in the studio recording a new album, and we was going to shop to get a new deal. And that's when Kenny got sick. We never even released that stuff. Yeah. Oh, how yeah, far did, did you about, get from? About twelve songs. 10, oh, that's an album. Yeah, we just never gave it to him. And you, you got to remember, I think we owed Atlantic two more albums in that contract, maybe two or four. I can't remember. But we never delivered it. We never gave him the song. We never gave it to anybody. And that song is almost like, you know, it is what it is. Uh, is it after Kenny passed that they thought, you know, it's, we'll just let you guys go? I mean, we, we, I mean, we, we, we won't come back after. No, we just... left. We left. Kenny, Buddy, and Jeff left Atlantic Records way before Kenny got sick. Why? We were, Why we're, you, I mean, okay, so 
to make a long story short, we ended up going to another department, which was called the Pop Department. We didn't actually go there, but they pushed us there, and it was like, what are they doing? You know, we had a new A and R, which was Brian uh, Reed, Ellie Reed's brother. Um, we had new people, and then you, they introduced us to this white guy named Tom. He said, "Oh, this is what it was. this is the vision I see for you guys, and I want to send you guys to Miami, Florida to do the photo shoot." And you look at the second album, we got these. these yeah, the white. Two, yeah, yeah, it was like we, we in this photo shoot, like okay, the hell. <laughs> so we want to make you guys, you know, at that time, pop was the word, you know. In, new in kids the in the block. Community. No, not new kids in the block. Um, bam, bam, ba- um, Backstreet in the um, Backstreet Boys. Back- uh, yeah, yeah. But, sync. but uh, even New Edition was considered pop because they went popular. You know, they weren't just R and B. New Edition had a a fan base. You know, beyond R and B. But that's why we said, you know, we need to restructure this and we need to make some decisions. So we all were on board and we left. And that's that. we can't, okay, well, most of us would think about labels and they're thinking, why would they just allow you to leave? <laughs> it's like, you know, you can't just say, I want to um, leave. There was, there, was, there was enough reasons that I care not to go into, but they, okay. knew, they, they, didn't, they didn't want any problems. So, um, and again, I appreciate everything Atlanta done for us, but we had to make moves, man. And unfortunately, it, you know, it didn't come to fruition the way we wanted to because uh, we weren't in charge uh, of what was planned. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, you're talking about with with Kenny because I'm sure, um, you know, yeah, because this was right in the mix of it. So he passes six years. Are, are you and, and Buddy still then talking about okay, what are we gonna do, or do you just go your separate ways and just try and? No, we we all we all went we all went our separate ways. Buddy was dealing, you know, he got married, he had children. Myself, I went into the corporate world, um, and then I said, you know what? I don't like what I'm doing. I was making a lot of money, but it wasn't what I was liking. Um, ironically, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still in, you know, working for the city of New York, believe it or not. Um, and um, I have a great staff and so forth. But what I look forward to, you know, I know your time is ticking soon, but you know, that 30th, the 30th anniversary is the, is the, 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 the meat of the bones and what we got yeah. planned for the 30th yeah. anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I guess a lot of us, I mean, Walking away was it hard? Because you know everyone would have known, known no, you and seen it, you. Okay, it wasn't hard. We got to remember we we created some great magic in the studio um, prior to Kenny passing away, and we knew that it would have been a fight for what label we wanted to get us. Because everybody would have tried to snatch us. Hmm. Everybody would have hmm. tried to snatch us, and it was like we were we we were almost there. And when Kenny passed, we was like we couldn't see ourselves doing it with him, without him. So we took a pause. And then we recollected ourselves. We started going back on the road, and people just gravitated. The fans gravitated to Buddy and Kenny. I mean, Buddy and Jeff, and, and we always kept Kenny in spirit. And they said, you know what? We're still going to rock with y'all. Same thing when they rock with H-Town as well. Yeah, yeah. A, a question came in. What what labels are the group going to be in? Were you, are you still with, a, I would say, you're not with Atlantic, but you're working with Atlantic to release? To so, on- yeah. So Atlantic was under Warner Music. Warner Music is the parent company. Uh, with our 30th anniversary double album, LP, um, we're going to be still under Warner Music with this album. Um, it's coming out in October. Um, one, it's going to be uh, a double album. One album is going to be, and it's vinyl. So this is almost mm-hmm. like a collectible for those, you know, vinyl is a big surge in Europe right now. Um, yeah. And we're going to be releasing. One album is going to be green. One album is going to be blue. It's going to have some of my greatest hits, some remixes, and so forth. And, you know, Warner Music is on board fully. You know, we're getting everything um, uh, done in um, the Netherlands, and we have our people over there get everything done over there that's uh, doing the mastering and doing the printing and things like that. So, you know, we're ready to go. We've got another big situation that I can't bring up yet, but <laughs> let's, say, let's just say this. No Army group has ever done it. But the people that's bringing us in are some big people, and it's amazing when it happens. So I guess when you get Buddy and I on a call again, yeah, yeah, it'll be done, and you'll know. But I, I can't. That's the secret. But it's nobody's done it yet. Nobody. <laughs> okay. and it's so dope. What I mean is dope. Is dope. Yeah. So you know, and there's another. Music. Okay, there's another people that would, would would tell me to ask because I think just during the lockdown, as we're coming out, 
um you went live to quit the group um and but now you're back so what what was it was, what, it was what? eternal it was we had eternal beat okay. like any other group you know i had just like my real brothers that we have fights and we don't talk for weeks and we come back together it was eternal beef is no secret everybody knew um I was upset, and I got on live, and, and I said, I'm not coming back to the group. I'm done. I can never do music with him again. And I, and I, and I, and I. That shit pissed him off, and uh, me and him talk about it to this day. But um, it was premature, and it was immature for me to come on live when I could have kept the beef in-house. And, um, yeah. So now we live and learn. We know now if we ever have a fight again, we know not to take it to social media. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Social media gonna run and make up another story. You heard Jeff was on live and he shot Buddy, and then and then his sister hit him with a bat and he ran and he got hit by a bus. And now he's on life support. <laughs> like, yeah. What's it like just the two of you performing? Because you know Kenny was such a powerhouse. How how do you guys feel in the? How do you guys manage and not feel overwhelmed? You want to hear something scary? Yeah. It feels like Kenny's on stage. I promise you, it feels like Kenny's on stage. It, and me and him, it feels like. I felt 25 years ago. It feels the same. You know, we, we just have fun with it. Uh, we know the fans want to hear the songs the way they want to hear the songs. We don't try to change it up and do anything. We try to give them what they want. Um, mm. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling. Does any part of you, if you, if, you, if you were to give advice to a new group uh, uh, and they had a lead singer like Kenny or, or Coco, what would you say to the group what, learning from what you guys went through where, you know, everything was on Kenny being, because he was such a powerhouse? Would you encourage the others to have spotlights on, on track so that it's, it, you know, you know, like Black Street was probably a big example where they made sure everyone yeah. kind of sang. So in those days, if you look at it, um, when we came out, we, got, we came off the hills of Guy. You know, although Joe C was right before us, when they saw, for some strange reason, when they saw the three-man group, it's kind of easier to focus on one person. It's a yeah. triangle. Yeah. It's kind of easier for to zoom in on one person to deliver the songs, and then we come in and color it. So it's like we knew what it was. We knew that the record label is the bank. They write the checks. First album, we're going to comply. The second album, no, we're going to actually show you what we can do. Yeah. But when his father died, that changed everything. And then when we got back and, and recorded the third album, it was coming. So we didn't get a chance to do that. But we get to showcase ourselves now yeah. and with Kenny yeah. and Spirit and so forth. But what I would tell the group, hey, listen, at the end of the day, the bickering and fighting will break you up. It will actually get you dropped. Uh, it will stop producers from working with you. Um, you got to understand it's a business first. So when you first get on, try to pay attention to the business first. And when it's time to record, whoever sound look at 112. Slim is the primary sing lead singer of the group because his voice is so distinct. Yeah. All right. Even though yeah. Q Parker sung some stuff, but Slim was the voice. Every time you heard Slim voice, you knew it was 112. Yeah. That's a yeah. fact. But, you know, again, record companies look at it as a business. They see it's an investment. We feel that he's, you know, they're the stock market. We feel that if you keep him up front, our, st our, our stock is going to go up. Mm -hmm. But we're going to risk, we're going to risk, um, you know, investing in you guys separately if you want to do that. And we don't know if you can still carry the way he carried. Kenny, Kenny was a, 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 come on, he was a force to deal with. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was a force to deal with. So, it wasn't about who's better or whatever. He had a distinctive sound. Mm. And that's what made Intro stand out because his voice was different. It was different than anyone that we ever heard. A qu question came in that um, if Intro was to do a versus battle, who do you think would be your perfect competitor? Well, Ace Sound lost the lead singer. Two of them. Here we are, Intro. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and and I guess sometimes with the verses, they probably, I mean, the old verses was you playing your track against your track as opposed to the, the, then it switched to doing live. But when you think about your 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 your, your tracks, your, your your music, who's, I don't even know who could have been close oh. to intro back when, in the when day. When I think about music, ugh. 
Um, I wouldn't say Jodeci. <sighs> Intro and SWV was almost like the same group. When we yeah, first came out. yeah, I would say so. They're, 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 they're females, though. So when they do verses, they don't normally do females against males for some strange reason. I don't know why. Um, but if there was not a rule like that, I would say SWV. We we both came out together. We both hung out with each other. I can't think of a male group um, that would, when we talk music for music. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, who do you think? Um, I mean, thinking about it, I mean, because you, I mean, I, I, I hear you guys, I think of Mary and, you know, I think about the, you know, like those, the, 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 the tracks for that type of music. So there was not many groups that were doing, you know, the, um, you know, people are saying after seven, but I don't know because I, I, I don't know if, um, if, um, if after seven, um, was the same as, as, as intro because you guys were doing hip, it was, you had the, you had the yeah. untouchables doing these really hardcore beats, and then you had Kenny's his his, his, his singing on on top of it. So um, it's it's really hard. I mean, that's why you guys were really distinct and really in a place of your own. I think Atlantic yeah. just didn't know how to push you guys and market that's true. you guys well. Uh, we 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 created a new sound. Although people are saying that they created hip hop and R&B first. No, I think we actually. For the first to sing on raw hip hop beats, you gotta remember, ain't Puffy was living with Eddie F at the time. Yes, and we were recording music. If you listen to Jodeci's first album, all the up tempos was more like house music driven. It was New Jack, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Dalvin said they were they were doing a New Jack, and it just wasn't didn't work for them. But yeah, because Puffy took the idea that we were doing and brought it to them and remixed it with hip hop beats. Nobody was doing that. I'm telling you, we were doing, we had that stuff done already. Nobody was doing that. Yeah. I said it. No, no, it's true. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I did I did tell that to Slim and Mike when I interviewed them that they, they said they, they were the first. And I said, well, I think intro really, um, I what said did intro say? would. What did they say? <laughs> no, they, they said they were the first to come out with hip hop and, and hip hop, uh, R&B no, when, when you said intro, what did they say? It, well, no, they, they no, they still said that they were still the first to do it, <laughs> and I think you know I they were on the coffee, but coffee, yeah, but it was they came out way long after you guys had already come out yeah. and stuff, but yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, the stuff. I think coffee so, took them coffee. further, but it it doesn't it, it just but they it, it, he was just copying what you guys were doing and stuff. So yeah, I love you know. I love one twelve. The, the one twelve was dope, man, and and they, they definitely took it to a higher level. You know, you had. The, you know the most hottest label behind them, which was Bad Boy. Yeah. There was nothing hotter than yeah. Bad Boy at that time. Yeah. So what 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 can what can people expect? You know, you've told us about the 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 vinyl coming out later this year, but tour wise, where can we expect to see you guys? Re yeah, it's going to be a 30 anniversary tour. Um, we're going to be hitting a lot of cities um, in the United States. Um, we're going to be hitting a lot of places in Europe. Um, okay, so. I can't mention the other one, but it's connected to Africa. So we're going to be definitely um, in those in those continents. For okay. real, for real. Yeah. Are you doing anything for local in, over the next couple of weeks or so? Oh, yeah, yeah. We got tons of shows lined up. But I just want to say one thing. Promoters, don't hit us with the Chitlin Circuit stuff. We turn it down all the time. We're not going to do it. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> okay. So we, we do have income, bro. We're good. <laughs> okay. 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 Nobody's been in your, your mother's garage. None of that. But, <laughs> okay. you know, at the end of the day, you know, you got to respect the artist. You got to respect the craft. You got to respect the body of work. And, you know, anybody that's interested in doing work with intro, you know, just shout us out, man. And we'll, we'll you know, as long as it makes sense, we'll be there. For real. Yeah. And, it, I, and I was joking when I said Chitlin Circuit because without Chitlin Circuit, you know, a lot of artists can't eat. So yeah. I was joking when I said that. Did did you ever consider getting another lead singer to make you go back to being a trio? trio? We we did we did have that. We, we started mm -hmm. off with um, yeah, we started off with um. We actually got two videos out. Um, I didn't sleep with her and um, and one more song. It's on YouTube. Um, we first one was four of us. We tried something new. We had two new guys in the group. Yeah, wow. and then and then we ended up keeping one of the guys and got rid of the other guy. 
Um, and he was strong. He was good. But he clashed with um, with Buddy. Him and Buddy okay. clashed. And then eventually he, he clashed with me too. So he had to go. <laughs> yeah, okay. But before him, we had a real, before him, we had a really good guy. Um, his name is Quinn. Um, Kermit Quinn. He's out of Atlanta, Georgia. He sings uh, with a group called a jukebox, a band with a jukebox. He's like the hottest thing in Atlanta right now. And mm-hmm. um, Quinn, Quinn was like he to me. I think he was too busy trying to do his own thing. But mm-hmm. Quinn was amazing vocally. He was amazing. He actually ended up being in Black Street as well. Mm-hmm. After us, yeah, he was dope. But he he got his own you know thing going on in Atlanta. Yeah. So we did get, you know, with the, with the clashes of the personality, we just kept it with us. You know, you know, it, it'll be great to find someone that's really dope. But right now, you know, it's, it's us right now. Yeah. Well, you know, after Seven did it, but they, they worked hard in, before they, they were able to find somebody to, 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 um, um, to join them in. And it's not easy when you, you guys have been around for more, than th- for more than 30 years and then somebody comes in and, and tries to find their place and especially if they're being put in the forefront to do those power ballads and stuff and and and, um, and really know their place it's it's probably can be a challenge as well yeah personalities is important man if you can't get along with if you're new and you think that you can come on this boat as if you travel the world with us prior and think you're the man bro you don't belong here Humble yourself. Learn the ropes. Don't come here big headed and think you're going to just run with the, you know, with the baton. No, it doesn't work like that. I mean, everybody got to get along, and we never, ever act like we were big headed. We were like so cool. We even still split the money evenly. But you know, some people come aboard, and it was just hard to deal with. You know, so if we were to find someone, it got to be someone that's humble, somebody mm-hmm. that just loved the craft and want to work. Yeah. You, you people, I think one thing a lot of intro fans keep asking is that we hear little snippets of, of unreleased stuff all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, are you guys ever going to get to control of that and, and try and put out a package of... We put that We put that out. Those are throwaways. We got a ton of songs. We just put that out. Okay. So that's nothing about... That's no leaks at all. You know, that was just... You know, we, did, we put a mixtape out first with those songs on it and people just grabbed it. But yeah, no. Music, I mean, come on now. I could go home right now and create a whole record um, within two or three hours. Same thing with Buddy, you know. I'm a producer, he's a producer. It's not, music is like making a, a meal. You know, as <laughs> long as you have the passion for it, as long as you have the ideas, it's going to formulate. So, you know, but we are. You know, with this 30-year um, anniversary album, after we, you know, take this around the world, we're definitely going to release another album. Look at look at intro like um, how can I say this? One of those groups that only release one album every ten years or every fifteen years. You know, there's bands like that, and we're mm-hmm. one. We just you'll you'll just get a golden moment when it comes. So Jeff, if people if people want to follow you and find you, where can they where where where, where, where they can they keep track of of yourself? I'm and all over. The, I'm all <laughs> over the place, bro. My name is my name is uh, Jeffrey Sanders on Facebook. I got three pages, but you'll notice when you go to either, when you go because they're all full. When you go to one of those pages, you'll see in the, in the, in the top it'll say this is not my personal page. This is my personal page, or this is not my main page. It'll say this is not my main page. But when you see my page, you'll you'll notice which one is the main page. On IG, don't kill me for this. I got a long name, so it's. <laughs> It's Jeff underscore official underscore R&B underscore group underscore intro. I did that on purpose because, my, listen, my first IG was hacked, and then I, I got it back, and then I was talking about Donald Trump. They took that sucker down. <laughs> Only because I was, I was going after Donald Trump. They literally took my IG. And I had probably around 12,000, 13,000 um, followers. That page is going. So this page I got now is like 5,000. But yeah, so it's Jeff underscore official underscore R&B underscore group underscore intro. You can find me there, yeah, man. You know, I be on live sometimes talking crap. But a lot of my stuff on my page, honestly, I'm all about having fun. I joke around. I throw a lot of funny videos up and things like that. But um, listen, I love the fans. I love, I love uh, getting personal with people. 
And sometimes when I get on live, I let people come on and we talk crap. You know, know, I always end my interviews by asking my guests that if you were stuck in an elevator and you had to um, watch a movie until they get you out, what would be your all-time favorite movie to watch? You're going to kill me. And all, and all of my male friends are going to kill me. Yo, I'm a sucker for love stories. And my favorite love story, and it's not even a black movie, yo. It's like, it's something about this mu- this music in the movie that just touches me. And it's called Love Affair with Annette Benning. It's amazing, bro. I love it. Yep, it's called Love Affair with Annette Benning. And that's that's probably one of my favorite movies, man. On a rainy day, I'm good. Wow. But I'm going to tell you something else, though. This grown-ass man, in the nighttime, the original Wizard of Oz, I turned it real quick. (laughs) As a kid growing up in a Christian household, all we knew was God. Then you see flying monkeys, (laughs) that stuff haunted me for years. So to this day, if it comes on, and I'm home, I live alone. I live alone, and when it comes on my TV... <laughs> I can't do. I can't watch the Wizard of Oz, man. I can't watch it. Okay. Yeah, it didn't scare me. Those monkeys. Yeah, those. Yeah, not oh, yet. The Flying okay. Witch. The Flying yeah. Witch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Watch, watch yeah. sleep. Oh, that was scary, bro. <laughs> what about your song? What's your all-time favorite song? Not not intro song, but just any you know your your, oh. your go-to track. My all-time favorite would probably be Donny Hathaway song for you. Okay. And I have to have, I have to. Okay. <laughs> Sam Cooke probably might outbeat Donny Cook. I mean, Donny, Donny Hathaway. Sam Cooke, um, I love everything Sam Cooke done. I watch all the documentaries Sam Cooke have done. Uh, but, yeah, I'm a big Sam Cooke fan. Big, big, big. Yeah. So I take it way back. Yeah. Wow. Intro tracks. What What would be your top three that you guys recorded in both albums? What would What would be your top three? That's so easy. Don't leave me. One of a kind love. Come inside. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That's not fair. That's not fair because it's way more. Okay. Ribbon in the sky. Oh man, that's probably one of the hardest records to do because the pressure that came on us. When people came, told us Tim Tim Dog was our uh, one of our A and R's. Yeah, man, y'all need to do Ribbon in the Sky. We looked at him like, "You crazy? Hell no!" <laughs> Nobody touches Stevie Wonder stuff. And uh, Jodeci did, you know, their joint. It was nice yeah. and smooth, but we said we're gonna take it a notch. And um, that was probably the hardest song vocally to record um, because you know that you can't mess up. And it's, and it's fast forward. We met Stevie. And he ended up getting in the video. We ended up recording um, an album, not an album, but a song for All, All Men Are Brothers um, for the Curtis Mayfield soundtrack. Mm. Um, and, you know, with a collective artists and everything. And when we recorded, when we recorded, uh, I was standing right next to Stevie. He had us in a circle. It was intro, Stevie Wonder, Johnny Gill, and Terrence Trent Darby recorded that song. Mm. And I promise you, I said, if I mess up one note, he probably said, stop, stop. <laughs> So he never did that. I didn't mess up at all. I was so focused. I said, Lord, I prayed. <laughs> I said, please, Lord, don't let me hit the wrong note. Because, you know, being that Stevie, his ears are more sensitive. Because yeah, he can't yeah, see. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God. And he bust my butt in air hockey two games in a row. I was so mad. I said, bro, you're not blind. No way. <laughs> you're going to be blind and you're whipping me in air hockey. Like, he was, we was going hard. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> well, he, yeah. I heard stories about him driving people. You know, that's the thing is, let, let him drive and stuff. So I he wonder can, if he's he visually me, impaired. <laughs> he told me. He told me after he beat me, he said, "You know, I could see silhouettes." Uh, that's what he told me. Yeah, he actually said that. I could see silhouettes. I looked yeah. at him like, "Wow, yeah. yeah." Feels like the first time. That's my favorite intro track. Feels like the first time. Yeah. Oh yeah, feels like the first time was actually cool to record. And actually, cool to do the video. Um, the same director that did Boys and Men video. Um, oh, Lionel, 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 Lionel Martin. Yeah, yeah, he did our he did that video. And if you look at uh, 
some of the stuff with Boys and Men, he grabbed some of those ideas as well. Especially when we're going around the garbage can and threw the snow up and all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was Lionel Martin, man. That was that song was very, very, um, very, very nice. Very nice song, yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't make your top five, so that's that's uh, that's that's different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, Jeff, it's it's been great, and you know we, we've been live, and I'm I'm glad we we were able to, to to catch up to be able to hear your stuff, and and I know that I'm gonna get yourself and Buddy back um, when you guys when the album's about to come out, so people can can see it and. You know, I think people are going to be wondering: Are they going to be able to get it digitally? Uh, if you know, the, the, the... oh yeah, 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 yeah. All that, all that stuff is coming, yo. Yeah, hell yeah. Here's the thing, man. The great thing about music, you can get it anywhere. It's going to be anywhere. It's going to be everywhere. And when we do this, it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. You know, it's going to be nostalgia. It's going to be everything that people expect. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I think one one of the things that I've noticed for yourself is that you don't seem to have the same. I mean, you, you seem very relaxed and chilled about, about the music, uh, and and I think uh, you wonder if it's because you're not dependent on those streaming services to make the money, so you can pay your bills, and and you and you just enjoy the creative part of creating music and entertaining, and it's not about, you know, at least this needs to go viral. Well, so I, I, mean, make... oh, 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 oh. I didn't say that. Well, did. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say there was the driving force. The driving force is actually, you know, loving the the passion of doing what you do. That's the driving force. And mm -hmm. if if you if that is your driving force, the rewards will come. So yeah. So how I think, if you love what you do and you're going to end up putting out great stuff, and you'll be rewarded for it. That's how I think. So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, final question is. Um, who who would be a top three out, not a, outside of intro top three R and B groups from the nineties? Joe to see Drew Hill. Ooh. From the nineties. Go to see Drew Hill. I can't think of anyone else as far as like what I liked in the nineties as a group. I, I like everybody, but female. Female. Okay, be male or female. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's not cool. Okay, Jody Drew Hill, SWV. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Cause yeah. I, I listen, I love I love H Town, I love Shy. I can't I can't pick everybody. You say three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as I said, we you know we loved all of them, and and I guess it's just more so when it's always interesting to see artists who were they looking at and admiring when they were when you guys were in your prime. Who were you looking at and think, wow, we love what they're doing? Oh, I don't know if you know this fact, but I used to date Coco. I used to deal with I didn't. Lily wasn't my girlfriend, but we used to deal, and um, <laughs> they all used to hang at my parents' house in the basement. So that was that was a that was a cool fun fact. Yep. <laughs> sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. I know that there's there's a drama, there's a documentary that was we're still waiting to see. We can't wait to yeah, intro. Yeah, yeah. I got I got another idea too that I want to share with buddy uh, when I speak with him. So right now we got um, this mansion, and every June we we got a mansion in the Hamptons. Buddy's actually he should be there already because he's on the phone on his way there now and taking some equipment up there because we're going to be recording this weekend up there. And um, when I speak to him, it's a dope idea. Um, it's, it's another documentary that I want to present uh, that we need to probably do. Um, and it's, it's the, you know, going deeper before intro coming into the group and where we're at today. The documentary that we have now is basically, you know, snippets of what we've done in the past, um, you know, stuff about Kenny, stuff about us individually and where we at today but i wanted to go deeper like because we all got a story before intro yeah yeah, yeah. i mean and, and 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 it's not as hard to to do to film and to to fill it back so i mean and i think that's what you know there's a lot of people that are I'm looking, looking for i'm looking for a a dope director if you hear me now let's talk uh, um you know i do screenplays i write you know all of that stuff i i got it i could do the whole script in about a week yeah so holler at me for real for real if you if you a good gp yeah you got jeff you underscore yeah. r&b intro underscore music <laughs> it's jeff 
underscore official underscore R and B underscore group underscore intro. But I do need some. I, I do need a good DP, a good DP uh, director of photography, which is a person that works the camera. So I, I do need someone that's really good. That really got really good equipment, and I want to. I really want to. Really want to do this for real. Yeah. Well. Well, Jeff, it's it's great that you finally made it on um, on, on Half Time Chat. As I said, people have been commenting and, and and asking questions as we've been going along and stuff. And you know, putting out the vinyl would be would be great. And um, seeing you guys back on 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 the road and stuff would it's it's great and stuff. So. We definitely look forward to continue to support you guys and 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 celebrate intro. Thirty years is not a, it it's it's not an easy thing to to, to continue doing this, you know, continue going this long and stuff. And it's uh, fun, yeah, man. it's fun. Yeah, I mean the fact that you 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 can balance a nine to five as well as the music. That's 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 a lot of work. <laughs> oh yeah, my my career is more than a nine to five, bro. Um, I want to if any of my employees are watching. Thank you for not stressing me out. <laughs> Love y'all. Thank you for New York City for trusting in me for the position I have. Thank you for the nice checks I get. Thank you for the opportunities. <laughs> but yeah, music is more is more fun than that. So Yeah, yes. Yeah. Anyway. Guys, I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, but and um and yeah, Buddy's probably watching, some others are watching. We will get them both back in later when the um the album is it is it october is it coming out in the fall october october okay. yes yeah so as we're as we're getting ready to release the uh, um we, you know we may do some listening parties and it's stuff your 30th like that. anniversary 30th anniversary yeah, yeah. so and um, and hopefully uh, i mean are you guys still doing anything with adf actually yeah we got plans to do some stuff with adf we was on the phone with adf about three weeks ago um, chopping it up, man. Like, you know, that's our brother, man. Yep, we definitely are. Yeah, and the rest in Untouchables and stuff. Uh, I saw you guys at, yeah. at Donnell's 50th. Yeah, and we was also at Kenny Smooth's house, too, before um, Donnell's um, birthday party. Yeah, we had a good time, man. It was like nostalgia all over again. Yeah, with Kenny Mookie Smooth as well? Huh? With Mookie, Mookie. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's our uh, boy. Mookie's always with us when we go to the south. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I like Mookie. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay, well, guys, it Jeff, it's been great. And but as I said, we're going to get you back. Um, and you know, welcome to halftime chat. Um, it, it oh, I think he dropped off slightly early, but anyway, guys, I want to thank you guys for um hanging in for with us. Okay, there you are. Okay, I just left with it. Okay. Yeah, we, we we we've lost your audio. Um, let me see. Yeah, but anyway, guys. Um, yeah, thanks you guys for for tuning in for 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 watching. Okay. Just, there we go. Okay. Yeah. No. It, just any final words just before as we head out. <laughs> um, like I said, uh, keep your heads to the sky. <laughs> My next album, Jeff on top. I'm only playing, but um. <laughs> Now, I just want everybody to just keep it positive, man. Um, whatever struggles you're going through in life, man, tomorrow is always a new day. Give if you know whatever you believe in or whoever you believe in, you know, I'm, I don't knock you for any of that. But know that the power of the mind is amazing. Um, just trust in who you are, trust in your craft, and it will all work out, man. Just stick to it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, especially to the, the loads of intro fans out there who keep who keep the intro things alive. Tno one uh, of Tno seven and you know, you know I'm the only one in my family without kids. In my whole entire family. Wow, that's sad, bro. <laughs> I need a wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, about to be the, you... I'm about to be the past the poor bro. <laughs> So, so yeah, I love okay. everybody. Thank y'all. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, definitely. Oh, see you guys. So yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, guys. And um, and yeah, as I said, intro will be will be back later in the summer, just as we're about to promote their 30th album and stuff. But it's been great seeing you guys, and it's been great with you, Jeff. Thank you, man. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you all. all. Right. Take care. All right. See you guys. Thanks a lot.